Okay, well, our next session is going to be on atrial fibrillation, the controversies, complexities, complications, and Dr. Damiano is going to lead the discussion. Okay, well, you're all still surviving here. We'll do a half an hour on afibrillation. I'd like to ask our distinguished panel to come up, uh, Sam Balky, Dan Bethencourt, Steve Hoff, and Randy Wolf. If you could just take seats and we'll... Um, how we're going to do this session is we are going to do start with a couple cases and then maybe try to touch on some of the uh, controversial areas of afibrillation and there's certainly um, we could fill probably three hours on that. Um, you know, afibrillation is certainly much um, in some ways uh, a more recent um, addition to the armamentarium and cardiac surgeons. Though, when we look back at the history of arrhythmia ablation, it really goes back to the very earliest days in cardiac surgery, and the first VT cases were done in the early 60s, and uh, arrhythmias that we no longer treat, but uh, we started WPW surgery dates to 1968. Um, certainly the Mays procedure, which was the first interventional procedure introduced for atrial fibrillation, um, and the Mays procedure, many people forget, preceded catheter ablation by almost a decade, but the Mays procedure has been introduced now over 30 years ago. Um, and while I think we've got a long experience in arrhythmia surgery, our um, recent experience where there's been large volumes of patients have really tremendously added to our understanding. Um, and I think we've had some recent papers in the last four to five years which have really clarified some of the real advantages of afib ablation in patients certainly coming for concomitant cardiac surgery. And I think we might have some discussion maybe about that at the end. Um, but I think the area of lone or standalone surgical afib ablation remains uh, fairly controversial. And we have a panelist, I think our panelist uh, really will cover some of the spectrum of the different techniques that have been um, have been introduced, and, and we still are at a, at a situation in 2019 where we really don't have, um, except for the um, biatrial maze procedure, we don't have long-term follow-up to make a lot of decisions about what to do. So in many cases, it comes down to judgment and or clinic, ongoing clinical trials. So I'd like to start with our first patient, which I'll, I'll do and, and just throw out to the panel. And, what I'd like to ask you is, you know, for this patient, what would you, what procedure would you do? And I'd like you to touch on, after you say what you'd rec, what you'd recommend and why, just a little bit to tell the, especially the fellows and medical students and even surgeons who aren't really in the field, what, how do you work up these patients before you bring them to the operating room? I think that's really uh, critical um, in terms of avoiding. Avoiding complications can often be done if you do the appropriate uh, preoperative evaluation and don't get surprised. So let's look at this patient. This is a patient who was sent for standalone ablation. It's one of actually a recent paper that I, a recent patient I saw in clinic, but it's a 62 year old patient, had a, a, a five year history of long, of, of which started out as paroxysmal, but has become would, would qualify now as long-standing persistent AFib. Um, it was first really diagnosed um, three and a half years ago when he had a stroke. In retrospect, the patient said he had palpitations for about five years, so we're saying it's about a five-year history. But he presented initially with a stroke, and that's how they found the AFib. He's failed antiarrhythmic drugs, and he's failed cardioversion. He has not had catheter ablation at all. And um, his BMI is 40, so he's obese. One of the reasons, um, common reason the cardiologist will send them for surgical ablation. They don't like dealing with those patients. And his echo shows a normal EF, no valve pathology, and a left atrium that was 4.6 centimeters. So, um, I don't know, we can work from Steve, why don't we work from you over? What would you do and how would you work up this patient before you brought him to the operating room? So referred for standalone AFib, the first uh, issue is does he have standalone AFib or not? Right. So he needs um, uh, 
Uh, for us, that's, he, he's had a structural heart uh, screen, doesn't have concomitant valve disease. He needs his coronary screen um, to be sure that he doesn't have concomitant coronary disease. Um, and then for us, a pulmonary screen to help with uh, the decision about an approach. Um, uh, and presuming all those are okay, and uh, we're really dealing with standalone AFib, then uh, in a patient with a long-standing persistent AFib, uh, for me, uh, the options are uh, bilateral thoracoscopic ablation, left atrial appendage ligation as part of a planned hybrid procedure, endo and epi hybrid, or uh, a right thoracotomy minimally invasive endocardial cryoablation with left atrial appendage ligation from within. And so then it's really just a matter of, you know, talking with the patient about uh, approaches and durability and uh, the issues of his obesity and, um, uh, you know, which approach may work best. We tend to um, uh, operate on a lot of those patients, uh, as you know, as a bilateral thoracoscopy with the epi endo hybrid. Can you just mention, just before we go to Sam, uh, a pulmonary screen? Could you clarify just a what do you do? Testing, just to be for us, that's about uh, being sure that they'll tolerate single lung ventilation for thoracoscopic ablation. So, so but you'd also use the single lung ventilation for a right mini, I assume. I, I right? don't. You don't. Okay. It's Sam, what would you do, and how would you work that patient up? Um, I think I'd uh, do everything that Steve said. Um, most importantly, uh, look for reasons um, that it's not a lone AFib. Um, having excluded that, the only thing I'd add is uh, maybe a sleep apnea test. Um, I think he'd usually, from my EPs and cardiologists, would already come with that because that's one of the risk factors that they look for. Uh, sleep apnea is, is a big deal, especially in obese patients in um, uh, atrial fibrillation. But given the fact that he's now persistent or even long standing persistent, I think that um, a, uh, a Cox Maze procedure um, would be the way to go. And what I would offer this gentleman uh, 40 is up there, but it's not the highest we've seen. And um, what I would do with this man is I would do a, um, a robotic assisted biatrial cryo maze procedure on an arrested heart. And uh, the way we do that is the way we do mitral valve surgery robotically, and we would cannulate the groin. Obviously, you do a CT angiogram prior to exclude um, aortoiliac problems and, and uh, atherosclerosis and aneurysms and whatnot. But uh, we would cannulate the groin, um, use the endo balloon. Um, if there was any issue with that or any issues that I would predict with using the endo balloon, then I would just do a fibrillating heart operation. Um, and uh, do a uh, right and left atrial cryo maze pattern, uh, Cox maze four. How do you manage the appendage? Uh, in those cases, when I'm opening up the left atrium, I would do a, a double layered running sutured closure of the appendage. With uh, I've kind of vacillated between using a 40 proline and a CV4 Gore Tex, and we've gone back to the proline now because it just slides better and, and follows easier. Excellent. Dan? Mine's easy. I'd do exactly what Sam just said. <laughs> <laughs> Would you no, do because it? Because really, that's, what, that's the operation I do for lone AFib across the board. It's an endoscopic, truly endoscopic, um, robotic Cox cryo maze 4, I guess it is, um, with entirely cryo and then internal ligation of the appendage. Or occasionally, if the, if the setup is right, we can put an atricure clip across the transverse sinus the way Clifton Lewis does routinely on all his mitrals. He's done at least 200 if he's reported and probably 200 since he reported it. So that we've done a, a fewer times, more like a handful, but it's, it's very doable. And I do think that the atrial clip is a really secure way to, to take care of the appendage. So I'd be tempted to do that in, in this kind of case. But the advantage of the robot is that although it's a little unwieldy doing a large patient, Dr. Murphy, Doug Murphy used to say the, the robot doesn't know the patient is obese. So you can do, you can reach everywhere, you can do the exact same uh, no compromise operation uh, that you otherwise would. You make a, uh, saying endoscopic is generous because I, I would make a larger um, thoracotomy incision for my assistant who has to manipulate the probe, et cetera. But those are all kind of minor details. Otherwise, CTA, um, you know, TE, pulmonary functions as we talked about. And Dan, I was wondering if you use the robot, um, how do you, do you, Undock the robot and remove everything to put the clip in, or how do you do that? No, no, you go on pump. Uh, 
you go and pump, but before you open the heart, before you stop, arrest the heart, and before you inflate the end of balloon, you um, uh, place the dynamic retractor across the left atrial, uh, into the transverse sinus, lift up the aorta, and drop the flow for a period of time. You pass the clip, and then through a series of maneuvers between your assistant and yourself, you can shove the clip down. The appendage generally just pops right in. You pull it up, fire it. It takes less than a minute. So the table side assistant is, delivers it. Is it the Pro V clip, or are you using the? It, most of us have found that the that the the, sing, the 35 uh, second first or second model of the yeah. of the, the enclosed clip is actually more reliable because the Pro V clip you've got to be able to see the other side and be right. sure it's okay. You can use a bigger one, but you're still not sure. And most of us just use the 35 on everybody, no matter what. So we don't size it. We just use that one. Okay. Randy? Uh, for pre-op, um, TEE and CTA, um, this guy's had a stroke, so I'd like to make sure he doesn't have any thrombus left in his heart. There are a lot of false positives with the TEE. CTA is better, and we reported years ago what's called the 60-second solution, which we use here now. So uh, during the CTA, there's a second set of films that are taken at 60 seconds, which gives the appendage longer time to fill. And it dramatically decreases your chance of a false positive uh, thrombus in the left atrial appendage. Then I would have a discussion with this guy. We use three, I use three criteria. One, size of the left atrium. I think you said it was 4.6, which is pretty large. And, and, and if you, it'd be better to look at volume. I bet his volume's really big. Uh, probably twice normal, but yeah. sometimes the measurement can be very deceiving when the left atrium can be, in fact, quite large. The second is how long has he been in continuous AFib? I think that's important because not all long-standing persistence are the same. If he says, well, I, or if he had, there was there evidence that he was in sinus rhythm within the last year, hmm, that might make, might make me change my mind a little bit. If he's been continuous for three or four years, probably less likely chance that a minimally invasive procedure would work. So there's some wiggle room in, in the long-standing persistent. Then the third criteria that I use is just the ECG, and I look at the A wave. If the A wave is greater than a millimeter, that means that atrium is still pretty active. But if that A wave is less than a millimeter, that atrium is pretty much shot, probably fibrotic, probably not going to respond to a minimally invasive procedure. And then I have a talk with the patient and say, what do you want? What's your goal? Is your goal to not have another stroke? Is your goal to be in rhythm? If his goal is to be definitely in rhythm, then I would probably offer him a Cox Maze 4. If his goal is mainly just to not have another stroke, then I might offer him the minimally invasive procedure. Last week, one of the patients here had BMI of 41, and it's not fun to do, but did a bilateral mini thoracotomy, and, and he uh, was discharged on the second day post-op. So it can be done, but not the easiest procedure. So I think you could go either way with this guy. Yeah, I think that was really an excellent discussion. And you guys, that was, I would only add, I, I think that the points just to emphasize to the residents and fellows, you know, really, when someone comes just for AFib, and, and occasionally they'll come not having seen, uh, and not having had a huge workup from an electrophysiologist, I think we're seeing more patients being referred, particularly after maybe a stroke, from their primary cardiologist. And I think first, most important thing, rule out structural heart disease, and I agree completely with the TT. And if there's any question in this patient um, we actually did get a TE for exactly what was said that we were worried that there might because of his prior stroke. Um, and we get for all the, we do all the both, uh, for almost any minimally invasive case where we're doing a, a full biatrial maze, we would get a CT angio and I think that's really critical. And I think we talked about some of the issues in the previous thing about that. Um, we tend not to get a pulmonary screen unless they have a history. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, so just to mention, if there, we, the TE was to look for thrombus, and if we see thrombus, we would not be using that clip technique that I described, <laughs> obviously. We would sew the appendage from internally. 
Okay, well, that, that is a great thing, and we're running short on time. So let me ask, we're going to now take the patient. I will tell you what this patient, we did get a CTA, um, and as Randy predicted, it showed a large left atrial thrombus. I have a picture of it, but let's, it, it, which is pretty dramatic, but he has a big left atrial thrombus. So now how does that change your approach? And we can start anyone, but now you have a patient who absolutely has a left atrial thrombus. It was, it's clear on both uh, TE and the CT. <laughs> How do you deal with him now? And let's say no structural heart disease, we're still dealing with a long, a lone, long-standing persistent. And, you know, I think I totally agree with what Dr. Wolf said about, but it can be really hard to try to figure out how long they've really been in persistent AFib. But I do agree duration of the AFib seems to probably be the most important thing, even more important than paroxysmal versus persistent in our, in our series. So now you've got this big left atrial appendage thrombus. What are you gonna do with this guy? Uh, for me, it's, it, it's gonna be an open procedure. I would do a sternotomy, Cox Maze 4, uh, very carefully, the usual way. Yeah, I think it actually makes it easier. The decision's easier. It just obviates all the epicardial approaches. Now it's entirely about your choice for endocardial ablation. It's either right thoracotomy or sternotomy. You pick whatever you're comfortable with. Dan, would you, in a big thrombus, do you still, would you still do a robotic approach? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd do the same approach. Uh, I'd be very careful to uh, not touch anything until the clamp is on and the, and the aorta is occluded before uh, manipulating that uh, left-sided uh, 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 you know, and you know, you're not disturbing the heart, you're not rotating the heart, you're going straight into the atrium, you go on pump, you stop the heart, open the atrium, first thing you do very cautiously and fearfully, um, expose that huge thing and then suction it all out from the bedside. And that's all, you're still worried about it, it's still a danger, but at the same time, I think it's really an ideal uh, way to deal with it. And it looks very impressive on the 10 time, 10 fold camera. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's, even it's, worse than your picture. Well, yeah, can it's I, interesting. Now, the one issue, and this is a relatively young person, and the only thing is that, as we all know, that the endocardial um, oversewing the appendage in anybody's hands has a pretty reasonable instance of, of failure. It, in the best of hands, maybe it's 10%. The worst of hands, it may be higher, way a bit higher than that, and that's an area of controversy. And, and I've always said I thought... I could do it. I do a two-layer closure. I use pledgets and, you know, we do everything. It's always a minimally invasive, but I have a lot of experience with that. And, and yet, I just have a case that's eight years out, but we, this is, and the TE shows, it doesn't even look like I did anything. But it, we had, we happened to have this, this same patient at a year. The TE showed completely, he had another reason he had to have a, a TE at a year, and it was completely excluded at a year. But it, between a year and eight years, it re I think that's part of, an, and what I discussed with this guy, and I would agree that um, I, I tend to most, a lot of them go through, um, if it's just a left atrial appendage thrombus, but no prior stroke, you know, but this is a guy who's had a stroke, so I think, you know, it, it changes a little bit of the ball game. You know he's got the substrate for forming this and, and having actual strokes, so. I mean, I think it's something to consider. We've done probably the majority of those patients as a mini thoracotomy, and I agree with you. The only thing you have to do is just cross clamp, not manipulate, and do not cardiovert the patient to try to do pacing for exit block until you have managed the appendage. But, um, you know, this guy, after discussion, and he's so obese, he's, he's gone. He, he just really wants, his stroke has freaked him out. He doesn't ever want to stroke it. He said, well, what's the best way I can never have another stroke again? That, the best way is to just cut the darn thing off. You can't use a clip. You you know, over sewing it from the inside, I think has a failure rate. It it's questionable whether how much that is, but it's something to consider. I think everything I totally agree, and, and some of the panelists have said, you know, the patient needs to play a big role in this, and, and they all have different thresholds of what's most important to them. Is it the are you with me as it stroke? Um, but you know, I think that's really important. I'd, I'd like to also throw to the panelists, you know, one of the things on this guy we did was also because we were, we were curious about how persistent his atrial fibrillation. So we did put a 48-hour um, Holter monitor on, and he was in 
Um, he was in AFib most of the time, but actually a lot of the time he was in atrial flutter, not atrial fib, um, which wasn't evident on the EKG that we just happened to get the random EKG. Um, if someone's in atrial flutter, how does that change your decision? Anybody wanna? Or does it? So they're not in AFib, they're, he, his problem he's is He's in flutter. both atrial fib at times and he's in oh. uh, a really organized atrial flutter. Probably for those of you who said to do a maze, but if you had said to do a hybrid, would that throw you off the hybrid thing and toward just a maze, or would you still? No, I think if, for the, from a hybrid standpoint, actually it um, doesn't change things at all because the catheter approach to what you've described as a classic right atrial flutter is, is extremely efficacious, one, and two, if the uh, EKG is wrong, what we're talking about is a more, or we unmask with a classic uh, right atrial flutter line, um, a more difficult left-sided flutter, um, then that's um, you know something that um, uh, also can theoretically be managed endocardially. So I don't know that the presence or, of flutters, especially um, uh, uh, run-of-the-mill right atrial flutter, would necessarily change our thought about hybrid. Yeah, I think if you had only flutter, then the question is, do you proceed if you had only flutter and a clot, which I guess is probably uncommon. No, he had both AFib and flutter. Yeah. It definitely wasn't just flutter. Uh, there are two types of flutter, and someone who's not had an ablation, it would be hard to imagine it's left-sided because that's almost always iatrogenic, so it's probably right-sided flutter. But I routinely do a flutter line with the cryo when I do the Cox Maze 4. I'll, I'll put a line from the tricuspid to the coronary sinus, coronary sinus over to the inferior vena cava. But when I do that, I don't do a, a right-sided maze. So I think that's probably too much, don't you think? It doesn't leave much left. Um, well, the, well and, and the right-sided maze will actually take care of flutter, too. A typical flutter, it's a different line. It's, epi, it's anterior rather than the inferior line the cardiologists do. But yeah, um, for me, it would change. We would just do a maze. The maze gets rid of, and if it is, you're right, it's most commonly right atrial flutter, but there's um, not many people gonna do a hybrid ablation on someone with a big left atrial thrombus. So that's gonna, that, that really, in this guy, it's, I, I present it a little bit differently, but one of the reasons he was sent to me was because they were teeing him up for a catheter ablation and the CT, which was done, showed a giant thrombus. So, but the maze does get, I would have to say just as I, a disagreement, the maze, the maze is procedure is the only real surgical procedure that really gets rid of flutter both on the right and left side very effectively. It is really impossible to get either of those lines epicardially. Um, in any technique, and they, I will tell the EP guys have a ridiculously hard time with left atrial flutter, but I tr totally agree with Dr. Wolf, it's usually iatrogenic. Um, boy, we've really, I have a million questions, but I didn't even get past the first, but, you know, maybe just, uh, but I think it was a good discussion. I, I wondered if, um, can I, do I have time for one real quick question? Because I want the thoracoscopic, okay, five minutes. So this, I'm gonna throw out to you. So this 52 year old patient, is sent for a thoracoscopic ablation. This patient has had one prior catheter ablation and has recurrent paroxysmal AFib that's only been gone on for about six months, but he did have a history of pericarditis um, when he had the catheter ablation. He was re referred for a thoracoscopic procedure. The dissection around the right pulmonary veins was difficult, and whether you wanna do this robotically or you're doing this thoracoscopically, and as you're passing the lighted dissector, all of a sudden, you can't see anything. You have massive bleeding. And how do you manage that? I'll, I'll first, whoever wants to take that on, first, what do you do for precautions? And then when you do have this massive bleeding, how do you manage it? What's your, let's say, you know, we have a guy here who's looking through the scope, and we've all had that experience when all of a sudden, maybe, at least I've had that experience where all of a sudden, you know, you have the total red out, you don't see anything. The, the first thing you don't do is clean off the scope because it isn't going to help. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one thing to remember is it's a low pressure system. It's high volume, but it's probably, wherever the bleeding is, it's probably low pressure. 
So the first thing to do is to get a sponge stick on there and try to, just like nor you would normally do, basic surgical technique, put pressure on it, and you can probably control it to some degree until you decide what the heck you want to do. And then you got to decide what you should do, but in, in my experience, it's best to do what you're most comfortable doing, which is usually a sternotomy. You just got to bite the bullet and say, we got to save this patient now. Do a sternotomy, get on bypass. If it's not a big problem, fix it and still do a, a cox maze 4. You can still do that. But I think the key thing first is, is control the bleeding directly if you can, because it's probably not high pressure. It's probably not aortic pressure. Yeah, I think that's really good. Does anyone else want to say when you're in the thoracoscopic space? You know, I think if you're on pump, it's a different story, but off pump, it's, and I totally agree with Dr. Wolf. I mean, the first thing you've got to do, you know, it's a problem if you get the red out before you have, uh, but a lot of times you can sort of see it happen and, and just get pressure and then stay calm and decide what you want to do. Um, and, and that could be also if it, if you're having trouble, you can, uh, go on bypass femorally and get the patient stable, um, while you then, um, manage it. That's the only thing I'd add. Anybody else want to add some things to one, how you avoid it? And maybe I'd be interested in also people talking about a little how to avoid that. So one issue. comment and one question. The first comment is actually, you know, when I talked about talking to patients about both options. This is one of those things, a presumed microperforation at the time of endocardial ablation or that sort of thing that gave them pericarditis. Um, this is one of those things that for me, steers me away from thoracoscopic uh, operation. I probably would not have offered that patient a thoracoscopic operation. I probably would have offered them an open operation or nothing is the first thing. Um, you only have to learn that the lesson you just described once, and it doesn't come back again. The second, actually, the corollary of the question is actually one of the patients that I was going to present. This is a clinic, a, pa a clinic patient I saw two days ago, who, in the exact same situation, uh, sent to me for a thoracoscopic ablation by a relatively aggressive ablating electrophysiologist in town, who, uh, in a patient who has um, uh, very symptomatic but paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. He tried to cross a very thick septum. Um, after the patient had failed a couple of class uh, one, three drugs um, and had difficulty crossing the septum. And when he did, he developed an enlarging pericardial effusion, mm. aborted the case, put a pericardial drain in, got 500 cc's blood out immediately in a liter over six days. Now, 30 days later, has sent the patient to me for a thoracoscopic ablation, and I echoed him this morning, and he's got a moderate circumferential pericardial effusion with fibrinous, um, uh, what appears to be fibrinous clad in there. What do you do with that guy? Robotic cryo maze. Yeah, or I do a right, I do them on bypass many. Would on you, bypass, on bypass. Yeah, would you tackle that guy, Randy, with a thoracoscopy? At, at, at a month out? Yes, he's a month no, out. No, no way. The, it, he, the, the inflammation is tremendous. Not at that point. Ralph, can I say one last thing about something that Randy said, which is, is I think, yeah. educational for me? And um, do you know of any studies that looked at the height of the uh, H, the um, the P wave in terms of well, success? Well, the A wave because they're in a fib. Or the A in wave, yeah. In yes. terms of success, yeah. there is data about that. Yes. Because I think the corollary to that, from the imaging standpoint, could be CMRI. You know, this guy Nasser Marouche, who is out of. Um, I think he's in Utah, Salt Lake City, yeah. and he's got a lot of interesting, I mean, it's very proprietary uh, software for the uh, MRIs, but I think that could be the imaging corollary to what you just said, mm -hmm. which is if it's a burnt out atrium mm -hmm. and the, the, the A wave is low, mm -hmm. then that could be the patient that you say, you know what, you're getting the real deal or nothing. The right. literature where you could actually find that, there actually has been a lot of studies, they're almost all in the Japanese literature, because they were fixated on that in the early days of the cut and sew maze. And they call it the F wave. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why, because of fibrillatory, fibrillatory wave. wave. It's the height yeah. of that fibrillatory wave. But it is a good, I agree, I, I use it if, if it's a real organized rhythm. I mean, it tends to be easier to treat either way. And, you know, I always tell patients when they come with pure flutter that, I, you know, I mean, the, the cure rate with the maze is 95%. It's really good. As they get smaller, but I, I totally agree with you, and it's, it's um, a cardiac MRI with delayed gadolinium, and it can look for atrial fibrosis. It's actually, we're doing a bunch of studies on that, both in animals and people. I think it's gonna end up being a good surrogate, because at the end of the day, 
I think it will allow us to decide who gets maybe a simpler and who needs more extensive operations. And with this, you can also map the fibrosis to uh, the left or right atrium, which could potentially help us one day to you know, say who, who should really be getting left atrial versus biatrial procedures. Or so who I think you should avoid operating on. What's that? Or who you should avoid operating yeah, on. Yeah, there's definitely patients that even with a full maze and even more than a full maze don't, don't come out of AFib. So, okay, you guys were great. Thank you.